Melinda Heck, pastor of the First Congregational United Church of Christ, Kent, Connecticut, and her daughter, Sarah, to introduce our next guest speaker. Those of you who know Lynn Redgrave know that she's a member of a renowned acting family, daughter of Rachel Kempson and Sir Michael Redgrave, and sister to Vanessa and Corin. She's been nominated for multiple Academy and Tony Awards, starred in, written, and produced plays both on and off Broadway, including Nightingale, which is currently showing across the street at the Hartford stage. She has toured around the country and the world, and she has been seen on the big screen. To go through all of her professional credentials would take the duration of this plenary session. But we at the First Congregational Church of Kent know her as Lynn, devoted mother of three, loving, grandmother, and a friend to all of us. Lynn came to our church soon after she was diagnosed with breast cancer. As a congregation, we wanted to extend our love and God's healing grace. And Lynn is a blessing to us. She is kind. She is compassionate. She is caring. And she is our friend. And she has embraced not only our church in Kent, but the entire United Church Christ, worshiping with other UCC churches while touring around the country. And so it gives me great pleasure, and it is an honor, to introduce to you my friend, Lynn Redgrave. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's, it's very exciting to be here. As an actor, I, I came in, I just said to Sarah Keck, Melinda's daughter, it's like dinner theater, except I guess this is breakfast theater. Um, Bob Chase and Davida Crabtree asked me some time ago if I would come and talk to you about my, what I call my journey through cancer land. As Melinda said, it was, in fact, it was in the, at the end, it was on Friday the 13th of December 2002 that I woke up early in the morning in New York City and turned over in bed and thought, this mattress, I've got to do something about it, it's so lumpy, and then discovered that it, the lump was me. Um, a terrifying moment, which I immediately went into denial about and decided that it couldn't possibly be that right now, absolute fittest that I had ever felt. I'd just had three months in Australia uh, in a movie of Peter Pan, having the most wonderful time swimming with the, the fishes in the barrier reef, uh, climbing and going all around Uluru. I was so fit and so healthy, and there was no breast cancer in my family. I had never smoked, and obviously this couldn't happen to me, right? But indeed, on the afternoon of December 13th, I was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. My tumor was large. Uh, it looked as if there were many lymph nodes involved. And I was absolutely terrified. Uh, I, w I then was so worried about how I would tell my family. First of all, my family was who I was worried about. And there were reasons why I didn't want to tell my children right away. My son, Ben, who any of you fly Delta, he's a Delta pilot. If anybody, you ever hear, hello, this is your first officer, Ben Clark, stand up and scream, I know your mother. <laughs> <laughs> My son, Ben, and his wife, Neva, were expecting their second child, my little grandson, Kyle. And my, my daughter-in-law, Neva, is Armenian-American. And there's a belief in the Armenian community that when somebody uh, 
dies. It's always a life for a life, and it's somebody close to you. And I didn't want to tell after Kyle was born because I was afraid that they would think the life that was going in place of Kyle's birth would be mine, and I didn't want to mar their joy. I didn't want to tell my wonderful daughter, Pema, in England, because Pema is very much into alternative medicine, and I'm not against that, believe me, but she would, I knew she would get very emotional, and I, I wanted to make sure I knew what my treatment was going to be before I told her, because she, I knew what she would say is, Mom, buy a plane ticket to Mexico and the peach pit and have a coffee enema, and I didn't want a coffee enema. I just didn't want it. You know, I'm English, tea maybe, but not, not coffee. And I didn't want to tell my daughter Annabelle, my youngest, because she was, in the, she was then a senior at Parsons School of Design. She's a fantastic photographer. In fact, some of the images that you're going to be seeing and perhaps you're seeing now were her, her photographs uh, of me. Um, I didn't want to tell her because of finals. I also thought that she wasn't, she was the youngest by, by many years, and I didn't think she was ready to yet take on the possibility that I might not have too long, and I thought at that point maybe I didn't. Um, so I, it was all set up, I went to Memorial Sloan Kettering, about whom I cannot heap, I can't heap enough praise on them for the, for the caring, for the, for the brilliance of their treatment had a mastectomy on January the 16th, 2003, and that was to be followed with chemo and radiation. My wonderful Annabelle came with me, my best friend from England. We all went to the hospital at crack of dawn. And I, you know, they put you in that little terrible hat and those terrible uh, little socks and the gown that's really embarrassing. And I thought, well, never mind, you know, we, they kept me laughing and everything. They'll come and stick a needle in my arm any minute and it'll, you know, next thing I'll know it's over. But they actually walk into the surgery. I wasn't sedated at this point. I was like, walk in, see, what, what, scalpels, I don't like that. Um, I had decided not to have reconstruction uh, for various reasons. I, it's a wonderful thing. It's a great gift to so many women, but I decided not to. And... As I was walking in, there was my surgeon, brilliant Dr. Patrick Borgen. I, mean, I believe in giving people credit here. Yeah. And he said, oh, um, Mr. Redgrave, this is the surgeon, the plastic surgeon, who if you had done reconstruction, he would have been doing it, but he's going to help me out today. And this, ladies, this was the most gorgeous looking man you've ever seen. <laughs> Even in scrubs, particularly in scrubs, perhaps. And I was, and there I am in my little hat and my little socks and my terrible robe, and I said, oh, doctor, if I had known you were this cute, I'd have gone for reconstruction. <laughs> <laughs> and they both turned pink and stuck a needle in my arm, so that was it. <laughs> uh, when I came to, um, this is what I looked like. I had earlier, when I did finally tell my youngest daughter, I told them all sort of around the same time, my children, after Kyle's birth, when Kelly got her, Pema got over for Christmas, etc. I had thought to, how will Annabelle particularly be able to, be able to look at me? How will she to not be so terrified? Because she's a brilliant photographer and because a camera can be almost like, um, it's like a protection in a way because you become the person you're looking at down the lens becomes the, the subject, rather than, that's my mom, and this is really scary. And I said to her, and she was thinking it at the same moment, would you document every step of my, for my surgery, post-surgery, and my chemo and radiation? And she was thinking the same thing. In her mind, she thought, if it's a, if it's a photographic project, then it has a beginning, a middle and an end, and the end is when mum stops treatment and she's well again. For me, it became this, I thought I was doing it as a favor for my daughter to help her. In fact, it ended up being a wonderful lifesaver for me. On those scary days that I was so afraid, going to the hospital was, you know, really, really frightening, but I was Annabelle, so that, that became the project, and I, couldn't start chemo for about four weeks because I got an infection and 
I remember going to feeling so tired and feeling so frightened and so scared. And I went to a concert at Carnegie Hall and I wrote in my journal, which I used a lot as sort of my therapy, my way of like putting my feelings onto the page and then perhaps I won't feel them quite so intensely. I wrote, concert at Carnegie Hall, falling asleep in the second act, mind racing, heart sad, lonely, nervous, a bit afraid. Around this time, I made a wonderful discovery. And the wonderful discovery was not only the woman who introduced me, but the first congregational church of Kent. I had not been a churchgoer. Yes, I would occasionally go to a church as a child, but I didn't come from a church-going family. They were a family who, oh, it's Easter, we'd better go, and oh, it's Christmas, we'd better go again. Uh, I just, you know, I, I, I didn't know about it. I was baptized as a baby. I was confirmed as a teenager in the Episcopalian Church, or Church of England, as we call it over there. Um, but I had never been part of a congregation. When I realized how afraid I was and how lonely, and that I had only recently moved to Kent, Connecticut, I then happened to hear through a friend of my son that there was a woman minister at the first congregational Kent. I knew nothing about UCC, congregational church, didn't know a thing. But in my vulnerable state, I felt that a woman minister, I would feel safe there. And I went the first day and I was kind of nervous. I was wearing, my hair hadn't yet dropped out, but I was about to, it was about to. So I was wearing the wig so that in Sundays to come, people wouldn't say, oh, your hair changed. Um, and the, it, was, it was a moment when I felt, I felt so lonely and so sad and I felt like a visitor. And I walked into the First Congregational Church of Kent and Melinda stood there at the pulpit and said, this is the day the Lord has made. And I thought, oh, and I immediately started crying. And then uh, we had wonderful organ music, some Bach. And then somebody who has since become a friend got up and said, please, could we have prayers for 26 men and women of her husband's regiment who just off? Um, to the Far East and uh, all of that. And I suddenly thought my little problem, like, okay, I'm missing a body part, but, but what is that compared to what so many people are going through? It was at that time that I felt that I had lost my innocence, the innocence that made me feel that cancer couldn't happen to me. How foolish of me to think that, but I think I'm not alone in, so many of us think it can't affect us. I then was still keeping it a secret, and I suddenly got a call from my agent saying, the National Enquirer are going to out you. Now, nobody wants to be outed by the National Enquirer. You know what that, I mean, I know, I, I fess up, some of you read it, so do I, but we don't want to be, we, <laughs> inquiring minds like to know, but inquiring minds don't want to be in it. Uh, <laughs> And I, they said, done with this story that uh, Ms. Redgrave has had a mastectomy, that she's going through chemo and radiation. And I was terrified about employment as an actor, that people would go, oh, she won't be able to work. Now, I was already in a play in New York and performing every night and keeping it a secret. Then I thought, well, I want to bring this out in my own terms. Because you know those inquirer stories, it's always, you know, bravely, bravely battling through her tears as she struggles to stand. You know, I, no, that, that, that wouldn't. Uh, at the time it, it came out, and it, did, it was indeed a picture of me sort of gasping, and you know, who knows where they took it. And Larry King, Jane Pauley, and Barbara Walters all wanted me to go and be a guest. And I chose Larry King because I knew he wouldn't get soft with me. For any of you who have gone through cancer treatment, you're, you're, I think it's the drugs, but it's also the situation. You're awfully vulnerable and, and trembly, and somebody says, oh, you look nice today, you burst into tears. Somebody says, you know, let me get that door for you, you cry. I mean, so if anybody shows you any sympathy at all, you're just going to fall apart, and I couldn't fall apart on national television. I was afraid, afraid that Barbara Walters, who's a wonderful, wonderful woman, and Jane Pauley would get a little soft with me, you know. How is it to look in the mirror and find you have no breast? Um, 
and, and I would start weeping and I would hate myself and, and so would everybody else and then, you know. But with Larry, it was kind of so, they cut it off and then, you know, I, I mean, that's... <laughs> and you just rise to the occasion, you know? So, uh, uh, at that, around this time too, my, my mother, my, my sister Vanessa, my brothers Corin and my mother, came with my sister Vanessa to America because Vanessa was going to be in a play in New York. My mother was then almost 93 and she came to live very near to my house, his guest cottage. This was like the blessing of all time because I was going through treatment. Had she reached her final days, I would not have been able to go and visit her because I would have to go on with my treatment. I couldn't fly and all of those things. But there she was. I didn't tell her I had cancer because I knew she would immediately think, that she was going to lose me, and I was the baby of the family. I am the baby of the family, her special angel, you know. So, uh, and she would. I had this wonderful wig. Quick plug for Raquel Welch's wigs. Anybody needs to go online, Raquel Welch. They're brilliant. You can get them in any style. And she would stroke my wig, and I by then had no hair, and say, "Your hair is so pretty." It was a privilege to be a part of her last days, and she passed away peacefully in my niece's guest cottage, just near to my house in the country, surrounded by family, by grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And all this time, I was attending the, the church, and I realized that I had never been part of, of anybody's death before. I'd never seen anybody dead until I saw my mother. I, you know, I, I come from a background in England where death is a little bit pushed under the rug and children don't go to funerals and things like that, or certainly not in my day. But it was such a privilege and at this time, here I was, I turned 60 and I lost my hair the day before. I was in a play. I was going through breast cancer treatment and my mother was dying. And people say, oh, that must have been the most terrible year of your life. And I say, no, in so many ways, this 2003, was one of the greatest years of my life. Because if I were given the choice, obviously I'm not going to be, that a magic wand could be waved and I could go back to that age of innocence where I thought I was in completely invulnerable to the idea of cancer or anything like that. What would I miss if I, did, if I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that choice and we'll roll back the time and we'll pretend it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and you won't meet the people. The people I have met through both this combination of attending the First Congregational Church of Kent, of getting to know Melinda and her husband Bobby and her extraordinary daughters Bethany and Sarah, of there of feeling part of it, but also the members of the club we didn't want to join, and I'm talking about cancer survivors, I've met so many remarkable people, and for the first time in my life, I think I was a rather controlling person who tried to control everything, and when you get cancer, you can't control it. And you realize, of course, none of us can control it. We can't control whether we live or die, but we can learn properly to live and have that, all right, you're in great hands here. And if time is short, well, at least live every moment so fully that when the day comes, either sooner or later, you don't feel you've wasted anything, that you've let go, you've seen the colors. And I mean, to begin with, for any of you out here, I'm sure there must be some cancer survivors among us here today, as well as myself. Uh, isn't there a kind of euphoria of suddenly you see, you look at the thing covered with the fall leaves and you've never seen the colors that bright? And you, you let go and you say, I'm, I'm going through this journey. For me, another great saving grace was that I was performing and doctor theater, as we call it. My, uh, when I was in pain from my feet falling apart from the taxol, I'd go out on stage and suddenly the pain is gone and you're, you're playing a woman who doesn't have cancer, so you have this little bit of time. All through months of treatment, I met such wonderful people at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And on my very last day of 
of radiation treatment. My daughter always said to me, Mum, don't, don't smile. I'm so used to putting on a sort of, you know, for a photograph, a, a kind of showbiz smile. And she says, you mustn't do your showbiz smile. Just don't do anything. Just do nothing. And on my last day of radiation, I was so happy this was going to be the end of treatment. I said, I had all these flowers to give the women who ran the, the, the radiation room technicians and I said please let me smile because I am so happy and I think that's the image you're seeing now what I've learned is that it doesn't really seem to me the point anymore how long I live it that seemed to me so important I've got things to do and places to go and 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 children to see grow and grandchildren to see grow and yes I want all that I'm extremely greedy I love life. I have a spectacular life now. Just spectacular because of all the reasons that I've told you. And now I know that it's not how long I live, but how I live each moment and how I reach out to others. And perhaps I was one of those ones who got cancer, who didn't have a history of it, because as, a, as an actor, and a well-known actor, I suppose you could say, I have a forum. I get asked to something at the Synod, and will I get up and, and talk and perhaps tell my story? Um, I admire the UCC so tremendously. I, I knew nothing about you, as I say, four years ago. I've learned a lot along the way, and as Melinda told you, I have found out a wonderful, I go online when I'm on tour, and s check out what UCC church I can reach and get to the matinee because we, like, like ministers, we actors usually do a matinee on, on Sundays. So we're, it's, it's really the same difference, you know. <laughs> and I... <laughs> I remember saying to Melinda, I'm so sorry, I can't come to church here. I've got a matinee. She said, well, I work Sundays too. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for what you've done, for giving me, actually giving me also faith in America. This has been a time in the last few years where I, as a, a naturalized citizen who became a citizen to vote, have lost of confidence in the country that I chose and that has been so good to me. But the UCC and what you believe in and what your diversity gives me faith that we I said to somebody the other night, if the UCC ran this country, we'd be okay. <laughs> and I mean that. I'm not just saying. I said it over dinner the other night at Maxis downtown. I end with something that uh, I'm sure you know, and that means a great deal to me, and that is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointed head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
body of Christ. Yes, there was you to take me through these tears. Yes, there was you, my holy family, always there, always present. I am a stranger among you. See what has happened to this body. I am not the woman I once was. Broken now. when I found you knew my tears, you knew my pain, you knew my agony, and still you smiled me, and still you held me close, and still you laughed with me, and every day with you was full of sunlight, full of shining. of cancer, no matter where we find ourselves, life's dark with shadows, laden with pain, so where is the light, and where is the peace, I come to you. Myself, I bring my woes, my sorrows, my pain, time and time again. 
little sisters and brothers stand near me, stand with me, and hold me close, and weep with me, and laugh with me. I smile again until I live again till every day I live is full of joy and wonder and I'll be here with you whenever you need me and I'll be are near, meeting here with great 